So welcome everybody. I'm, uh, I'm really thankful that you've joined us today. And um, uh, we've prepared this because we were asked uh, by many people um, to, uh, to do a workshop um, for biologists who are at home who can't, do, um, can't get their wet work done. And as computational biologists, um, we, uh, uh, we thought we were in a position to maybe teach you one or two things. Now, this is quite a challenge because, first of all, we've never done it before. Um, and uh, secondly, um, we are having 300 people like this uh, trying to cater to a very diverse audience. You know, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Um, on the plus side, hopefully you're all patient and give us a break if things don't work out um, as just happened. Um, and so uh, if we make mistakes, please be forgiving. So what are we going to do today? Well, first of all, um, I hope that you can um, all see my, uh, uh, my shared screen. I have a paper up. It's called An Atlas of the Aging Lung Mapped by Single Cell Transcriptomics and Deep Tissue Proteomics. Now, this article was published exactly a year ago. Um, it's a single cell RNA-seq study of uh, the lung in uh, young and, uh, and old mice. Uh, what we're going to do with this today is we're going to go through processing and analyzing a part of this data set, not the whole thing, uh, in about um, an hour, maybe a little bit longer, depending on questions and how things go. Um, we're going to be using something called Google Colab, which means that you will launch a computer uh, in the cloud for free. All you need is a Google account. And we've prepared a notebook that will download the data for you, process it, do a basic analysis. Um, and you'll have this notebook with you after this uh, workshop. So you're going to run it right now. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll set you up. Um, I will walk you through it as it's running. Uh, but there's lots of exercises, and you'll be empowered, hopefully, to uh, study this particular data set, but really any other as well. And actually, we believe that there's lots of interesting discovery to be made, even in this one data set. So we're hopeful that if you're interested, you'll do that. You can post comments about it on the GitHub later. Uh, we could even write a preprint together if people want to. Um, now, why did we pick this particular data set and paper? Well, um, we wanted a single cell RNA-seq data set. We wanted one that's publicly available. We wanted one that is published in open access format. And this fit the bill, not many do. We wanted a, a paper that's based on open source technology. And this particular data set uses DropSeq, which is an open source technology. And um, finally, we picked the lung in mouse because we thought it's an interesting topic um, for people to maybe think about. And we wanted to do something old, uh, but also something new. And we'll do that today. There's also something borrowed, and you'll see there's uh, something blue. Um, so with that said, just a few logistics. Um, Sina is going to um, uh, be, as I said before, Sina Bursagi, um, the person that you're interacting with. Um, uh, you'll be texting him questions. Uh, he'll be sending out links. There's a code of conduct. That's the first thing um, uh, to, to, uh, to pay attention to. Um, Please look at this code of conduct. Um, uh, it's on the GitHub. If anybody violates it, um, Sina will kick you out. Uh, but the basics of it are just, you know, be decent. Um, uh, you know, we're all here professionally to try to learn something today. Uh, the second thing is that we have a poll that we've posted on Twitter. Uh, Sina will now post the, the link for you. Um, we're just curious for you to fill it out. Um, uh, and uh, it would be great if you did that now uh, before we move on to the next steps. Um, it's just appeared and the poll will close in about 20 minutes and we'll be able to see the results at the end of the session. Um, 
The next thing is um, the notebook. And Sina is going to post a link to that right now. Um, so this is going to be a web URL. You need a browser open. Um, can you post it, Sina? There it is. Please click on that link. And what you should see is, um, sorry, what you should see is uh, this notebook right here. Um, uh, it has a bunch of text and it also has code, uh, not just the code of conduct, but Python code, as you can see down here below. So please um, uh, go and log in, you know, click on the link. Um, I have a section down here, a Google Colab. Let me zoom in here. You'll see that what you need to do, let me um, circle this. You need to go to the run all menu, uh, which is inside the runtime dropdown. And then, you know, after you click run all, just authorize starting the notebook with run anyway. And it would be great if you could just do that right now so that um, as we uh, uh, start talking about it, it's actually running for you. And by, by the end of the session, it takes about half an hour, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, maybe 40. So it's taken us occasionally 40 minutes, um, sometimes closer to 25, but, but hopefully it'll be done uh, by the end of this workshop today. And, um, and, uh, and then you will actually be at a computer uh, where you can actually continue to work on the data. You can always reprocess it later if you wish to. So I'll pause right now for uh, one second and ask if there are any questions through Sina and he's going to answer them uh, either individually or to the group as needed or I can answer questions if he passes them on to me. So any questions? All right. Um, okay, so uh, so hopefully you're um, you're now running this notebook, and now let me get into the mechanics a little bit of how this is going to work. So we're going to be this notebook is going to analyze a part of the data from this paper. Um, it's a lot to take in um, in terms of you know all the biology underlying this article all the bioinformatics, there's absolutely no way I can teach you all of it today. That's not my goal. Um, but I do uh, want to just give you an overview of how things work. And if you look at the notebook carefully, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, information inside of it and links to other resources. And hopefully, uh, at least it's a start uh, to fill holes that you might have. I will tell you that I'm gonna assume that you'd really have no experience whatsoever doing this kind of thing. Um, that said, I have some experience with it, and so I might forget what I what I know and uh, and and go too quickly. So so if I do, just let me know, and Sina will stop me. So this paper um, has uh, two uh, primary authors, uh, Ilias Sanchilidis and Lucas Simon. It's from the groups of Fabian Thies and uh, Herbert Schiller, and um, it's a really um, it's a, it's a nice single cell RNA-seq data set because um, what uh, these authors did is single cell uh, analysis of the whole lung. Um, it's in mouse, but they did replicates. So there are um, several young and several old mice, and we'll see the details of that in a minute. Um, in today's workshop, we're going to take, I'm gonna go back to our page here, we're going to take um, a single, uh, it says that up here, uh, we're going to take a single sample. So um, if you look, you'll see that there's eight three month old mice and seven 24 month old mice. And we're gonna take one of the seven old mice. We're gonna work through it and we're gonna see that we can reproduce some of their results. We're gonna see that we have all the data in our hands and our control so we can say more things if we like. Um, and then we're gonna look at a new question um, and you can already, have, you have the notebook up so you'll see that we're gonna look at ACE2, uh, the gene 
uh, that's the entry um, uh, sort, of, sort of doorknob, so to speak, for uh, coronavirus. And we're going to look at whether it's different in young and old mice. And it's, it's going to be an interesting result, I think, for you to see how we do that. Um, I will tell you that the ACE2 analysis at the end is done on the whole data set. So we, we process that basically with this notebook. Um, but it's going to be sort of an exercise for you to do that if you want to do it on your own. Um, uh, also, before I begin, I just want to do a very quick acknowledgement. Um, this workshop is based on a workshop we did at Caltech recently, about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Um, it was part of, uh, we have a Caltech Bioinformatics Resource Center that's directed by Fan Gao. Um, it was done in conjunction with another um, a scientist in the center, a statistician, Ingele Falkham's daughter, and we had about um, 40 or so attendees for a whole day where we could do some lectures and uh, not this notebook, but other ones that are linked to uh, here. And we, we built this based on that, but more tailored for Zoom and for biologists. Um, so last thing I've already mentioned this, but we've tried to keep everything open source. I want to just say how important this is because nothing we're doing today would be possible unless Lots of other groups made their work and their software and their data, in this case, publicly available. And uh, we're, it's, it's not just about being grateful to them. Um, this kind of thing really drives science forward. Um, and it's everything from the assay itself from JobSeek um, that was published uh, by Evan McCosco and, 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 and his co-authors well, uh, a few years ago. Um, as I said already, the data in this paper uh, is ready to go. Um, you can actually get the exact reads you'll analyze from an FTP site at the U European Nucleotide Archive. And this is a technical matter we'll talk about later, but it's a, that's a great, it's like the sequence read archive in the United States, but it, it serves up fast Q files, which makes it very easy uh, to process data through a notebook like this. Finally, Google Collaboratory, if you've never heard of it, um, it's a pretty new, it's maybe one or two years old Google service. And it's wonderful because it itself is open source and it gives you a free machine. Um, and we're going to make use of that infrastructure today. Okay, so let's start with the notebook. Hopefully this is running for you already. Uh, maybe I'll just pause if there are any more questions at this point. I don't see anything from Sina. Uh, Sina, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, we had one question. Someone asked how many replicates in these kind of control versus disease situations should you use? Okay, that's a great question about replicates. Um, well, first of all, the question was how many should you use? I will tell you that one of the great things about this data set is there's, there's replicates at all. Typically, people have no replicates. Um, they just take a sample and run it through a technology and try to assay the cells once. Um, so this is already a great uh, resource, this data set, the fact that there are different uh, sacrificed mice. Um, I think the answer is to how many you need. I can't answer that, you know, in, in general. It, 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 I do think I can say definitively that replicates are essential to learning uh, something about the biological variability in your data, um, but it really depends on the goal of the experiment. Uh, we will be making use of replicates later um, to uh, when, as we look at ACE2 in, in young versus old mice. Um, in bulk RNA-seq, many people actually limit themselves to three or four replicates, which is already useful. Of course, the more replicates, the better, but we're, we're talking about sacrificing animals here. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a complex question. And there's another question about batch effects. Uh, someone says that they hear that 10X is mainly, there's batch effects between chips rather than between the wells on each chip. Uh, do you have much, uh, can you comment on that effectively? Yes, that's also a good question. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this workshop today. Um, there are, first of all, experimental methods now uh, for pooling different samples in one single uh, single cell run, whether it's with DropSeq or with 10X, uh, genomics, 10X being another commercial technology. Um, those methods are, have been shown to be very effective at reducing batch effect because it's one single library preparation that takes place. It is true that distinct library preparations will introduce batch effect uh, which is another good reason to do replicates. But I think the multiplexing technologies, 
are a very good way to go. And there's methods, uh, there's a, 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 a from a Rahul Satija's lab, Zev Gardner's lab at MultiSeq at, at UCSF, which is a very nice method. And there's one from our lab um, uh, 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 based on click chemistry, which is actually linked to at the end of this notebook. Lior, can you just briefly define uh, what a batch effect is? Yeah, just to tell people, so a batch effect's going to be a situation where, um, you know, maybe you're, uh, for example, in this case, maybe, um, I'm not accusing these authors, but maybe in an experiment you did the young mice on one day and the old mice on another day, and you're using a different kit, and you're doing, maybe a different person is doing the library preparation, and so you have effects um, that, uh, that are evident in your data that have nothing to do with the biology, but have to do with the day the experiment was done or the person who ran it or other technical artifacts uh, that we would like to not, um, to not be confused by or fooled by as we're looking for, let's say, differences uh, between conditions. Okay, so I'll move along here. So this notebook uh, started, um, uh, this step, we just do this um, it records the time it takes to run everything. And that's very useful for us because then we can have an idea of which steps are slow, which are fast, um, what we need to wait for. Uh, that's all that is. Um, and then the next step, I'm gonna go block by block here. This is installing lots of packages um, for this run. I mean, we have launched a fresh machine. All of you have launched a fresh machine today on Google Colab. It's a pretty limited, but actually pretty good machine. It might be better than some of your laptops. It has about a little over 12 gigs of RAM. Um, it has two processors. It has quite a bit of disk, um, many gigabytes. It depends exactly the instance you start up. Um, and, and so the thing about it is, so it's a fresh machine. It's like you just brought it home from the shop. And so we need to install all these packages a pip is an installation, uh, a package installation um, a command. And some of these packages are huge um, community um, resources like NumPy that have been worked on by dozens or even hundreds of people. Um, some are fairly recent. This is a package laid in out for doing um, clustering. Uh, ScanPy is a great package uh, from Fabian Thais's group, who's one of the authors actually on the data set we're gonna look at today. And, um, and so we're just installing all these packages from scratch. Some of them are already on this machine because it comes pre-installed with a few, but we put them in here so that you can take this notebook onto your own server in the lab or even your laptop. And um, if you install Jupyter, then you will be able to run this locally and not in the cloud if you want to use it, for example, on human data that you don't want to put in the cloud, or if you want to just run it faster um, or on an airplane. So uh, we, when you don't have an internet access. So that's what that's doing. And I'm going to move down um, to the next block. Um, the next is a package, KB Python. It was written by an undergraduate uh, student at Caltech by the name of Joseph Min. Um, he did an incredible job uh, wrapping together two tools from our lab called Callisto and Bus Tools, um, which make possible to run and process single cell RNA seq reads on very limited hardware. Um, we're not actually fixated today to use our own tools at all, and you'll see we're using tools from many groups. But as far as we know, this is the only tool right now that can be used on Google Colab because we worked so hard to make it run on very low memory. Um, and we think it's useful because we can have this workshop with you today and you can run it yourself. Uh, so that's one of its advantages. Now, this KB Python uh, can do a lot of things. I will show you today a couple of the things it can do, but there's a lot more under the hood. I can't go through everything. You should know that if you're interested, uh, we have other tutorials um, online and you can learn more about uh, all the things you can do with it. Um, we're gonna use it today to process drop seek data, but you can also use it to process 10X data. Um, you can actually use it to process just about any uh, kind of uh, uh, technology. Um, so, uh, so that's what KB Python is. It takes a few seconds to install. And once you have that, you're actually in good shape to, 
to process any single cell RNA seq data set. Now, the next box, um, which is download data, is commented out in, in, in these notebooks. Uh, the hatch is, uh, it says that, you know, it's a comment. So whatever is after it is just for you to see. If you wanted to run what's in that box, you would have to delete uh, those hatch marks. And these commands download the data from the European nucleotide archive. And this is called an accession number. And uh, these accession numbers can be identified um, when you look at articles and they will report accession numbers. And that's how we found this just by reading uh, the paper. Now, not every paper is sharing its data. Not every paper um, is going to have accession numbers, uh, but when they do, you're in business and you can download the data locally to your own computer if you want. But what we're gonna do here is uh, stream the data to the computer. And I'll explain to you what that is in a second. And that's why that box um, is commented out and therefore it ran in a couple of microseconds. Okay, uh, the next. Yes, go ahead, Sina. Can we do one thing? Um, some people are asking to see what the Colab browser actually looks like. Um, because me, what, uh, what Lior is showing, just so everyone is aware, is the is the Colab browser after it has been processed. We just downloaded a PDF version of it. And then could you just walk through how one would run it? Yes, great question. So, um, so now I'm on Safari. There's a menu and I click on runtime. And then there's menus and I click run all. And it pops open a window that says that Google did not authorize this notebook. This notebook is actually located on a resource called GitHub. Uh, Google doesn't never seen this notebook before, but if I click on run anyway, then if you look at the top right, it's connected now and it loaded up the machine. If I tap it, you'll see that it has, um, you know, 12.72 gigs of RAM and uh, 27, 28 gigs of disk. And now the notebook has started to run. And you can see that because there's a spinning black, um, I don't know exactly what to call it, a uh, little circular bar. And when it's completed, uh, like it, it's already finished the first cell, it, it moves on to the next, it'll just run through the whole notebook. And you can see that right now it's building this and that, it's installing the packages for me in the cloud um, as, I'm, as I'm talking this through. Is that helpful? That's perfect. Um, there's also one more question. So someone asked, how do we know which packages to use for each application? For example, for clustering, TCNE, UMAP, this person imagines that there are quite a few packages to do those things. There's many packages. I will walk you through in a second. Um, if they're all being loaded in this notebook, um, it's often like self-explanatory, um, but uh, you'll see as, as we go through the notebook, uh, there's an import command and then it'll become clear what we're using from which package. Now there's some packages that we're not loading up today that are very useful. Uh, we're not showing you everything. In fact, you could do everything we're doing today in, in another language uh, in R, but, um, but we're showing you some of the packages and. Maybe we'll do another one of these someday soon, uh, showing you different packages and different things you can do. Uh, we, we're sold out today, so to speak, so we're happy to do this again. Um, okay, so let me, um, uh, let me navigate uh, back. Uh, oh, I'll just show you that down here are the cells that have not been run yet. They have this sort of dashed bar uh, while these run. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just have this as a PDF so I can draw it. So the next thing is um, where this exclamation mark, it simply uh, tells uh, Google Colab to run whatever, uh, as a, sort of in the terminal of Colab, whatever is uh, listed in that line. Um, and so now we're running KB and what we're doing is we're downloading a reference index it's called it's it's a really important data structure that's going to be used to count the genes from the data you know how many are in each cell uh, we're in the mouse uh, we have set this up so you can uh, with this it's called a flag with this dash d you can just say i want to get the index for mouse but you can also get human or essentially any other model uh, if you like and uh, this command 
can also be used to build an index from your non-model if you like as well. Um, so it's very really flexible, but here we're just downloading the index um, uh, that we've previously built um, ju just to make things, to keep things simple. And now we're gonna do the first, so let's say call it step zero. It's in some sense the least interesting step. It's just to get a matrix, which is gonna have genes by cells and count for us, you know, how many genes we counted in each of the cells. Um, we're gonna use two programs called Callisto and Bus Tools. Um, and there's two boxes here, just to explain the first box you would use if you have downloaded the data locally with that other box that I commented out before. So we're not gonna do that because we're streaming the data and that's this box right here, um, uh, which is doing something that's actually pretty cool. We're giving the links to where the data is and what's happening is the program is flowing in the data from the European nucleotide archive, which is in some cloud in Europe. And it's sending it to the Google Cloud, read by read, okay? Um, and the point is that the data never gets stored to the disk. So even though this machine that we've just loaded up is not very powerful and doesn't have that much storage, we're never actually saving the data. The implication of this is that this work flow and this notebook can be used to process arbitrarily large data sets. The only limit on Google Colab is that it has to run in one day because then they shut down the instance. So, as, but that's quite a long time. So you can really process our, like essentially very large data sets with the streaming ability. And then there's some other flags here. Um, the dash X specifies the technology and you were using Dropseek today. So all we had to do is say dash X Dropseek. If you have a 10 X data, then you just say dash X, dash X 10 X V3 or 10 X V2, depending on the version of 10 X. Um, we've specified the index that we've previously downloaded. Um, so that's, you, you, you know, that's simple. This I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the H5, uh, HDF5 is a, um, uh, a compression format. And some of these matrices get very large. You know, we're talking about pretty big data sets nowadays with tens of thousands of cells and many, many genes, tens of thousands of those. So this is a compression thing. And honestly, you don't really need to worry about it. You set this flag to keep things small and then you load in in that format. Most of the packages for analysis today can handle not just this format, but other ones. And by the way, there's other formatting options here for you if you prefer. You can also just output in text if you want to really just look at it and load it into Excel um, uh, to stare at, especially if it's not a very big data set. And finally, um, this dash T um, is the number of threads that just tells Google Colab to use both of the processors that are on its machine. If you're working at home on a more powerful machine or on, at work on a server, you can process much faster uh, by increasing uh, the number of threads. Hey, Lior. Yes. We have a few questions just so we, yeah. Yes. Um, so the first one, sorry guys, there's a lot of text. So I'm trying to get through it as best I can. Um, okay, so the first one was, um, Yes, so why did you guys choose to use Callisto instead of 11 for pseudo alignment of single cell? That's a good question. Um, so uh, so there are um, uh, several programs that can be used for processing the reads. Um, 11 is another program. It can be used for 10x data. Um, uh, I think, I don't recall now if it can be used for every technology, but I think it can be used also for several others. Um, there's also for 10x data specifically, there's a program called Cell Ranger. It's very popular, many people use it. Um, for today's workshop, we had to use Callisto um, because it is uh, the only program uh, that will operate um, in the small memory footprint um, that uh, is needed for processing the data today. So we have only 12.7 uh, gigs of RAM on this machine. And everything from 
um, you know, aligning the reads here. Uh, we're technically doing something called pseudo alignment. We'll talk about it in a minute, but but that step all the way to getting the count matrices, it's all being done in a few gigs of RAM, and that's not possible with 11. So so practically, that's why we used it today. Um, uh, but there are also some other reasons. Um, we uh, we believe that the way that we're um, uh, you know the technical aspects of how we're getting the counts um, we believe are good with our bus tools workflow and uh, we think there are some caveats with 11 that I'm happy to talk about later but the primary reason is simply the practical one of being able to do this with you today we have a few more questions later um, so the next one is so the data that you get from this paper um, you know how, how would I access it and is it just the raw data that comes off the sequencing machine or is there anything that's done to it okay that's a good question so um, the, I'm, I'm not talking too much today about the technology. I'll have a link in a second. I'll send you to if you're interested. But after they did DropSeq, they created a cDNA library, so uh, which they sent off to sequence. Uh, I don't know where they sequenced the specific data set, but the, what came out of that are um, what are called FASTQ files. Uh, that's a file format. And we can go through that in a minute, actually, and look at, at that if you'd like. Uh, but it's a file format. Um, uh, that just has ACs, Gs, and Ts that, that came off these reads. Um, these are uploaded um, typically to something called the sequence read archive, and it stores them in another format. They have a proprietary format, and uh, they have tools that you can download uh, to download um, and, and wrangle the, the data. Um, the SRA is mirrored in the European Nucleotide Archive, and not always, but many of the data sets there are also stored directly in the original FASTQ. Now, where you would find this is if I switch over back to the, um, I'm sorry, to the article, um, it's usually buried in the bottom. Um, so uh, uh, if we go here and we look at the data availability section, it's the last thing always, but it's the most important one. You'll see that um, that the data is available under that accession in something called the gene expression omnibus. Now, if I click on that, let me see if I can click on that. I'm not sure I can click on it, but you can uh, click on it if you go to the paper. Um, and there you will find links um, uh, to um, the actual accession numbers where the reads themselves are stored. Oh, okay, so we have a few more. Um, thank you guys for all the questions. Sorry, there's just a lot. I'm trying to get through them. Um, yes, that's fine. So the next one is, so someone asked, you know, it's nice that this thing can do streaming, but what, what exactly does streaming provide um, that, you know, as opposed to just having the files sit on my machine? Um, so I think that it's um, a couple of answers to that. So uh, as a, and please, is Astina just a question? Is the volume okay now? My speaking volume is it better? I think it works for me. Um, if someone had a okay. problem. Okay, great. So um, yeah, so to answer your question, um, it it has the advantage that you don't have a footprint on the disk. So uh, for today's workshop, it was really convenient uh, to show you that you could process arbitrarily large data sets on Google Colab. The second thing is because you're not first downloading the data and then loading it back in, we have found it to be significantly faster. Um, it's, it saves some time. Um, uh, other than that, there's no particular reason um, why you would use this and not download the data. It's just that if you're like us in my lab, we process a lot of previously published data quite frequently. It's nice for us to not just fill up our disks with other people's data. So. Uh, okay, another question. Someone asked, do you need to quality filter and trim reads before pseudo alignment? That's a good question. Uh, the question, you know, um, about trimming the reads. Sometimes there are sequences in the reads that can confound the alignment step, um, adapters of various kinds. Uh, we did not filter or trim the reads in this analysis. Generally, in single cell RNA seq, it's not necessary. And in particular, with pseudo alignment methods like Callisto, um, it's not necessary because um, the methods are quite robust uh, to access sequence, for example, in the reads. People have looked at that and it's not necessary to trim. It is true that sometimes there will be settings 
even in single cell, um, especially when people have fixed linker sequences and barcodes, for those of you who know about those things, uh, where it's convenient to trim beforehand. But here we have not done any trimming. Uh, okay, another question. Um, so someone, um, someone said, the speed of streaming depends on internet connection and if the FTP server is close to it. So someone's asking, you know, does, like, what are the variables that, that affect the speed of streaming? Um, uh, that's a good question. So um, there's gonna be sort of two um, bottlenecks. On the one hand, the pipe out, uh, which in this case is the European Nucleotide Archive, and the other is uh, the one in. Um, and there's also the speed of your internet connection where they're sitting at home. One of the, uh, you know, we're sitting at home, we're sitting at work. Um, one of the really uh, great things about using Google Colab um, is that it's actually, it's on the Google Cloud and we have found transfer rates to be very fast into, because Google has big, presumably, fiber uh, for, for their cloud. You're not streaming this data to your own laptop uh, or your own machine at home, you're streaming it straight from one cloud to another cloud. Um, so those uh, things affect download speeds. Um, uh, and generally, uh, this will be the, by far, the rate limiting factor. If you look at the notebook today, some of you might already be nearing the end of your runs. Um, I can look at my own here. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, I'm not quite done yet, but I'm in the middle of the pseudo alignment step, but, um, but you'll see that almost everything else takes a couple of minutes. Um, so that's the rate limiting step. Um, uh, okay, then another good question. Someone was asking if we could clarify the division of work between Callisto and bus tools in the context of constructing the gene by cell matrix. Um, that's a great question. And I'm gonna actually get to that in the, sorry, in the notebook itself. Let's keep going down here. Um, so I have some text in the notebook about this and uh, th a great question, let me walk you through that now. So um, there's really two, uh, two separate steps that happen, um, two programs that are being run when you ran this KB. The first, Callisto, what it did is it took as input um, the, the reads and as output, it produced something called a bus file, which stands for barcode UMI set. Um, and it really didn't do very much, this program. What it did is it took the reads, and this being single cell, there were barcode sequences in these reads that identify which, for each molecule, which cell it came from. And it's organizing those barcodes into this file format. Uh, we'll talk more about UMIs in a second. It's also storing those in another column. And finally, it's giving information about which transcripts or genes, depending on how you do this, um, the reads uh, were compatible with or aligned to, if you like. Um, all it's doing is creating that file format. Now, somebody asks why we're using Callisto and not 11. 11 is a, what you might call an integrated tool. You know, the input is the reads and you get a count matrix as an output, which is really convenient and it's really great if you're a biologist to not worry about what's going on underneath the hood. Here, we've achieved that with the KB wrapper, but by splitting apart um, the processing to first getting this file format and then working with that file format, we have a lot more flexibility and modularity. So it's very easy with this workflow to change the next step, which is how you do the actual counting. So here you have a lot of decisions to make. Are you gonna do error correction on the barcodes? How are you going to error correct the barcodes? That's probably technology dependent. How are you going to deal with unique molecular identifiers? The purpose of these is to account for and adjust for PCR artifacts. There's a lot of ways to go about doing that. All of these steps are completely customizable and we already have a lot of customization options inside the bus tools part where we have a lot of tools and programs uh, to do those steps in various ways. And that's also what enable us enables us to facilitate really working with any technology. Because if you want to skip the, the error correction or you want to do it differently, it's very easy to write that part and, and split it out. So, uh, so there's kind of two big steps. There's getting to the bus file. You can actually, the bus file is quite small. 
And you can pass that around from one lab to another or from colleagues at work. It's a basically a really good, we think, a really good sort of condensed version of the raw data. It's not quite the ACs, Gs, and Ts, but it's not the actual count matrix either. It's basically there's a record for each read, and it's almost as good as having the, the raw reads themselves. And once you have that, then bus tools gets you to the count matrix, which we're going to get to in a second. So I hope that helps. Okay, so um, I've put here some links to the Callisto paper right here, the bus tools paper. Um, I'm happy to talk more of them in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, we could do a workshop just on those later, um, but I'm gonna go on to this so we can get to the actual uh, processing because really so far has really just been step zero. So now comes some basic QC we're gonna do on our data. It's very, very important to do that sort of thing um, once you've processed the data set because you get a handle for, you get an idea of like, did the experiment work? Are there maybe artifacts in it? How should I filter the data or process it? You learn this from just looking at it. And now you can see um, what packages we're learning. Um, there's, you know, for example, um, there's import commands here where we're um, importing various um, functions uh, from these packages. We have, um, uh, you know, you somebody asks, or, you know, how do we know what to use for what? Well, um, you know, if you want to do TSNE, you import it from sklearn, which is a which is a Python package. So all of this is basic setup. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize and why we're doing this workshop for biologists is we know this is hard. Um, you're not going to maybe write all this code on your own, but once you have this template it's a lot easier to start with this or modify it. Like if you want to do another kind of visualization, you can Google it and you can find out what you should import and you can just import that and add a line later in the notebook. And you don't have to write everything from scratch. A lot of this other um, stuff is, uh, this is, this particular was, uh, material is written by Sina. It's for the purpose of setting a nice plotting and that sort of thing. Um, it's again, sort of optional, some of it. Um, but I do want to say that what's really important for you to understand is um, there's an object that, a data structure that we're going to um, fill um, that we call A data. It's something, it's a type of object called AND data. Um, I think it's a really big deal and it's a really big advance uh, by the ScanPy people. It's a really good way to organize the information in an experiment. It would be a whole tutorial or workshop just to talk about AND data. So again, I'm not gonna do that today. And as we go through this, you're gonna be more and more disappointed at everything I'm not doing maybe. Um, but, uh, but that's key to what we're gonna do. You're gonna see later that we're gonna fill this AND data object with lots of information. I also wanna say that the way that we've processed the data today is gonna to allow us to look, do a gene level analysis. You can also learn something about isoforms specifically. And we're not gonna do that today, but there's two papers we've written from my lab showing how to do that. Um, uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can look at those papers. And, and I am eager to do another workshop on isoform analysis. I will tell you that the ACE2 gene that we're gonna look at later on um, has three isoforms annotated in the mouse. Uh, it should be very interesting to look at the isoforms it would be fantastic if somebody wanted to take on uh, doing that and working with us uh, on that. Um, I should say that an isoform, you know, genes have multiple isoforms, of course. Um, these are different ways that the genes are spliced. So you can learn something about whether there's post-transcriptional regulation going on that's affecting the splicing. Um, you can learn about whether there's transcriptional regulation going on uh, affecting the, you know, based on different promoter usage, uh, turning on different versions or different isoforms of the gene. So it's very interesting to do this. We're not going to do it today, but it has not been done with this data set. It's a fantastic opportunity to write a paper if you want, um, just taking this particular data set and doing that analysis with it. This kind of thing can be done with many, you know, really any single cell RNA-seq data set. 
and has been done in practice for very few. I will also tell you that the best type of data for isoform analysis is called SmartSeq, it's the Merv technology. And this uh, paper, another reason we picked it is it also has SmartSeq data. So we haven't processed it for this notebook, but it's not hard to do. Um, and, uh, and we'd be happy, to, if you're interested, we'd be happy to teach you how to do that and facilitate doing that in a follow-up. Lior. Yes. Someone had a good question. So um, someone asked, you know, is it theoretically possible to do isoform level analysis on 10x data where the reads are coming from the three prime end? Yes, so the drop seek is also three prime end. That means that the reads are collected from only the three prime, around the three prime end of the molecule. It's usually a few hundred base pairs. And it is true that that makes it difficult to distinguish isoforms, but it doesn't make it impossible. And in these papers, we actually talk about the fact that you can learn something about different isoforms, not everything, not always, SmartSeq is better, but there's absolutely the potential to learn a lot about isoforms, even in 10X data or in DropSeq data in this particular case. In fact, in the ACE2 gene specifically, one of the isoforms has a different three prime end that makes it very feasible and tractable to work with. Okay, so, um, so moving along here, uh, the next thing we're doing is populating um, this object. Um, we have put in some thresholds and parameters here, um, which I'll talk about later. Um, there's something called flavor Surat, and that's not an ice cream flavor. Um, that's a kind of um, uh, an option for scan pie that has to do with how the data is normalized. There's a lot to parse under the hood with this. I'm going to sort of try to take it step by step. I'm probably going to forget to talk about certain things, um, but, uh, but we'll see what, what we can do today. Um, so, uh, and I should just remind you that I've, um, you know, for example, I have this paragraph here, um, which uh, links to another website that goes into the detail of what some of these choices are doing. Um, uh, and I, can, I will explain some of them today, but probably not all of them. Uh, I mean, I think a really great exercise for you, if you really want to learn about this stuff, it's great once you've run this notebook um, to go back and change some of these parameters, you know, change this to 19 or to 30 and figure out, like, does it change the results of the analysis and all the downstream stuff? And there's no substitute for playing with this. You know, I've done quite a bit of this myself. My graduate students do a lot of this. You start to get an intuition for which choices matter, which choices don't matter. Uh, and you start to learn how to develop a, a coherent workflow for your own data. I really would like to encourage you to not just take one of these notebooks, plug in a new data set, get something out of it and not do this kind of exploration and thinking about why you're setting these parameters to be what they are. Okay, so let's, um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm eager to get to an actual plot, an actual analysis, and we're almost there. Um, we've, uh, we've populated this AND data object for you. Um, you can see what the commands, whatever they are in Python. Um, but now we're ready to make the first kind of QC plot. And it's called a knee plot. It's one of the first ones we like to make. If you run 10x, which probably many of you have data in your hands at the lab, um, you'll see that um, it, it will produce a picture of such a knee plot for you. Um, so uh, let me go down here to this uh, plot. The code to make the plot is here in this notebook. Um, so you can play with that as well. If you'd like to change the color, you can change this G to an R. Um, the, this plot is really useful to make. Uh, let me just try to go through it uh, like sort of carefully here. So on the x-axis, we have UMI counts. Now let's talk about that for a second. So what happened in DropSeq is, is that we trapped cells together with beads in little droplets. In the case of DropSeq, these are polystyrene beads and they have DNA sequences, you know, barcodes attached to them um, that allow us to back out, um, you know, which cell 
uh, you were looking at when you recorded a read coming from some molecule, but also there's a UMI. And uh, a UMI stands for Unique Molecular Identifier. I've talked about it briefly before. It is um, uh, tagging the molecule prior to doing PCR. So you, if you get lots of copies of the same molecule when you PCR up your library, you're going to have the same UMI. And so you can collapse those and count it as one molecule um, and thereby avoid PCR bias. So when people end up with the count for a specific gene in a specific cell, maybe 13 or 14, then they're talking often about what you might call UMI counts. That's the counts after you've collapsed for the same UMI. And now on the y-axis, you're looking at how many cells were there. They are represented by barcodes, hence barcode on the y-axis, with that many or more UMI counts. So, you know, if you look up at the right-hand side here, um, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at a lot of counts. There's not a lot of cells. You see, like if I'm right there, there's not a lot of cells that have a ton of counts in my data set. There's a gradation. Some cells have many, some cells have fewer. You know, there is a threshold though, and that's where we put this, uh, uh, you know, this crosshair, where at that point, basically you have a lot of cells that are pretty much empty. 10 to the power of one is almost empty. All these are kind of junk cells. Now I should tell you that there's uh, a step that's happened before here with, excuse me, with JobSeq. JobSeq does not have what's called a whitelist. The barcodes are not known to you when you get your data. You have to figure them out from the data. That's different in 10X, which many of you are working with, where there's a whitelist that they distribute. If there's a known whitelist, you can take your data and you can error correct the barcodes, callistobustles will do that. But here we had to actually identify the legitimate real barcodes ourselves from the data itself. And in the course of doing that, we actually filtered the data somewhat because when we saw cells with, you know, with a barcode that was very rare, we figured that barcode's probably an error, for example, so we ignored it. So this plot is happening post a process where we already look for very abundant barcodes. And we actually have a bus tools command, bus tools whitelist that looks at a data set and tries to decide what are real barcodes. And then we can error correct all the data to those barcodes. So that's, um, so that's happening there. And um, I think it's um, maybe a good moment for me to pause. Uh, I almost choked on my water. I'm gonna take another sip and, and, and give you a moment to think about if you have any questions. Yeah, so we have a few questions, um, some really good ones actually. So, um, so the first one is why why doesn't why don't people use five prime sequencing? Is there an advantage to three prime? So one of the things about three prime sequencing is it uh, allows you to pick up polyadenylated transcripts um, uh, in a way that's uh, really um, not biased necessarily towards one transcript or another in theory. Um, a lot of the early protocols happened to be three prime because it was easy to put up um, poly T's on the beads, but um, there's you know, lots of labs are working on different kinds of beads that do different kinds of capture. There are now you can do five prime capture as well. So uh, uh, there's a different kinds of capture that are possible. One thing that I will say is that it's useful to keep in mind that SmartSeq that I talked about before is fundamentally different because there's random priming across transcripts. So you get reads from across the entirety of the transcript, neither five prime nor three prime, but the whole thing. So you might call that a full length method. And that's what makes it easier to distinguish individual isoforms. Great, um, another question. So, so someone asks, you know, if you want to avoid counting the same read repeatedly using the UMI, then why would you even do PCR at all? Um, isn't the job of PCR precisely amplify the number of reads? Yeah, so it would be great if we didn't have to do PCR, but the reason for PCR steps in the library is to get enough DNA material to run the sequencers. Um, so it's really a technical artifact, um, uh, you know, having to do that with just the, the mechanics of how we're 
preparing libraries and sequencing today. There's nothing fundamental about, it would be great to have technologies where we can just sequence straight up the RNA out of cells. And there's hope for that. Um, there's already been some direct RNA sequencing with Oxford Nanopore. Um, however, as of today, um, the kinds of data we're showing you here remain the predominant data type because the low cost and the throughput that is, that is possible. When you do direct RNA sequencing, it's very hard right now to get the throughput in terms of the number of molecules you can assay as you can with these methods that, that, that need to do PCR. Um, so another question had, so another person had the question, so what approach do we use for duplicates, false positives, and filtering after you obtain uh, the gene count matrix? Um, the knee inflection or, or something like droplet utils? Okay, it's a good question. I mean, there's no like perfect answer here. As we go through the notebook now, if I scroll down, we're going to call look at a moment at percent mitochondrion. Um, there look to be cells that basically burst, and so you have a lot of mitochondrion in them, you know, in the droplet coming out of the droplet single cell RNA seq. That's another filtering modality. Um, there's lots of ways to filter. There's no current like perfect best guideline. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. Uh, okay, and then uh, another question. So what if different cell sizes have different RNA content, then the UMI count may be biased for different sizes? Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, we have seen in our own analysis in my lab examples of this. I could pull some up later. Um, there are experiments, for example, uh, where people look at mouse and human cells at the same time. It's quite evident there uh, that a difference in cell size appears to give more reads in the larger cells. Um, you might actually consider this a feature rather than a bug uh, because you might be able to learn something about cell size. And that's a project that we've actually looked into a little bit in my lab. Um, it does mean that you have to be careful in interpreting uh, the number of reads um, or in normalizing for it. Um, it should also be said that when people look at data sets, the number of reads per cell tends to come off as the most variable uh, component in the data. Uh, for example, when you do something like PCA, which we'll talk about in a minute. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question and that is absolutely a known effect. And then there are many questions about um you know, multi-omics type site seek assays, uh, as well as combinatorial barcoding. Um, I thought maybe because we want to sort of keep focused on on just a single cell, we could hold those questions for the Q for a Q and A session after. I agree. Thanks, Sina. That's yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit later. Um, we would love to do another one of these Zoom meetings, uh, looking at a multi-omics data set. I think they're very interesting, uh, but we wanted to keep it to like the simple for today. Okay. And then one last, one, maybe one last, one last go ahead, yes. um, on doublet detection. Yes. Uh, so, so someone, how do you detect doublets? So let me just say for those of you who may not know that doublets are instances where you accidentally trapped two cells in one single droplet. That is an issue in 10X or in DropSeq. It's less of an issue in well-based methods like SmartSeq. Um, so it's very technology specific whether you have to worry about those. Um, there are methods for identifying doublets. We're probably going to see some in our data today. There are tools you can use to do that. Um, uh, you know, you, they can be slightly problematic in that you might confuse them for a novel cell type. Um, but they're also, I think it's true that they don't tend to be a very large fraction of the data. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're, you know, the answer is there are tools to do it, and I'm not sure we'll get through that today. Unfortunately. Okay, so let me go on. Uh, we're already at one hour uh, and we've uh, lost six people. So we have six spots, um, uh, but I'll try to go on. So I mentioned already mitochondrial content is something you can look at and we have the code here for you to do that. We've made a plot of the number of counts per cell, each dot here, this is one cell. And you can see that there's a group of cells that appear to have not a lot of reads in them, uh, they're close to zero, but very high content, so we can filter like at 30%. Some people filter at five for 
it actually is, again, actually, I think very important. Bioinformatics people often get this wrong. There are a lot of cases where, you know, it's interesting to look at the mitochondria. It's also the case that the percent mitochondrial content can differ greatly by cell type. So it's not a kind of one threshold does it for every data set kind of thing. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, let me go over to this plot. Um, it's another QC plot that we made here. This is library saturation. Again, on the x-axis, we're looking at the number of UMIs per cell. But now we're looking at how many genes did we detect in that cell? That is to say, how many genes at some non-zero um, you know, uh, measurement? And you can see that this is sort of going up linearly. Uh, but what you would expect is if you've, um, uh, you know, if you've done a lot of sequencing of your library, if you've really gone out and blasted it and sequenced to death, then you might see a curve that looks more like this, that tapers off. Because eventually, you've seen every molecule and you're sequencing over and over again. So here it looks like from the slope that we're probably on this part of the curve, which means that we didn't sequence this data very deeply or uh, you know, the, the lab that generated this did not sequence that deeply. Um, so that's a good plot to make as a guideline. You know, these off from these seeding libraries are now in your freezer. You might want to go back and sequence more if you're looking at, for example, rarely expressed genes. Um, in note of warning, a lot of transcription factors are, are, are not very highly expressed. If you're interested in that kind of thing and looking at transcription factors, you often have to go a lot deeper. So that's another good QC plot to make. This hard, you, you, you might notice here that we have, sorry, I'll go back here. We have a kind of boundary and uh, that's because we have done this filtering in the white listing and identifying the correct barcodes. And so we've, you know, we've eliminated, um, you know, this region here, we've just thrown all that data out already. Um, somebody asked uh, how many reads per cell uh, should you sequence, um, I mean, you can see from this data set that we're at somewhere like, you know, uh, probably a couple of hundred, um, you know, again, there's no right answer. Um, these days, I think a lot of data are at a few thousand uh, reads per cell uh, with droplet-based single cell and seq There's a lot of very interesting literature here that suggests that, uh, you know, if you're looking to identify different cell types, like to build an atlas, you might be much better off trading off more cells for less reads per cell. But if you're looking to really understand the transcription factors in a cell type that you're interested in, maybe you go for the deeper sequencing. It's gonna be very experiment specific. Okay. Um, one thing that we wanted to show you here is that there's a parameter called alpha when you, um, when you plot things. Um, and if I go back up here, you know, you just saw a, a, a smush of uh, a green blob. Um, you can actually paint the data in a way where the density shows up. So you're more transparent with the less dense you are. Um, and it's very important because, you know, you can get a sense from this that actually a lot of the data is down there in this experiment. So just wanted to point that out um, to people. Um, and somebody asked, uh, you know, why are there two populations of cells here? Um, I don't know the answer in this specific case. I haven't looked at it in detail. Uh, sometimes you get, um, you know, two populations because you had, uh, you know, some cases where you had droplets that had burst cells, for example, and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I don't want to answer this without checking carefully. And I haven't done that. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to go on. Um, we're now looking at an analysis part of the data. Um, this is where we really get into the meat and potatoes. So uh, I'll just go back actually before I do that. Um, based on this QC, we set various filtering thresholds and, um, and they're, they're up here in these parameters that you've seen up here. Uh, let me see if I can find now in the notebook, there's the mitochondrion one. Anyway, we, we filtered um, and uh, if you, at the end of the day, we're ready to analyze the data now. So, um, so let me go to the analysis. 
Um, ScanPy has a great option to start off with. Um, you can um, look at which of the genes uh, show the most expression on average in different cells. Um, so we made this plot from this one sample. And so, you know, these are every dot here is a cell. So this is a kind of a, a histogram. You know, there's a lot of data here, uh, like looking at HPBBS, there's a lot of data there and it tapers off. Um, this gene right here, you can see that, that actually there's a lot of cells here where this one gene is occupying a huge fraction of the reads for that one cell. It's very common to see MALAD1. This is a non-coding RNA that happens to have some A's in it, poly A tracts that get picked up accidentally. Um, so people sometimes filter these kind of genes. Um, sometimes they look at them. Um, I want to go for a second to the main paper. Um, let me uh, pull it up. Um, if we go to the end here, um, well, actually, let's go to the beginning of the paper, and I'll just show you this plot here. Um, one of the first plots that they made, um, it's figure one, actually. Let me let the screen stabilize for a second. They have processed their data. They found 30 different cell types, um, and they put marker genes for these different cell types. Um, this gene that we just saw in our notebook is uh, SCGB1A1. And you just saw on our plot that this thing is expressed everywhere. You can see that here. It's got this, you know, it's, it's got this, the, the blue dots are everywhere. It's actually in this picture because it's a marker for uh, um, these cloud and goblet uh, goblet cells, sorry, the club and goblet cells. Um, and so they included it here, but uh, they have a section where they talk about the fact that there's some artifact here. Um, it's again, it's in the best part of the paper if you bury, uh, it's buried here in the, in the methods. Uh, let me find it if under the section called single cell data analysis in the methods part of the paper, I'm gonna zoom in because it's miniaturized. Uh, you will see the gene mentioned right there. Um, and they talk here about the fact that, um, uh, that, you know, that this is an artifact. Uh, they explain why they think they saw a lot of this gene. Um, and then they delve into it. I wanted to note for you that one of the nice things, sorry about, let's go back to the notebook. Um, oops, I keep going back to the wrong place. One of the things about the notebook is we have a whole list here now and really, they kind of, uh, you know, wouldn't say cherry pick, but they highlighted this particular one because it, it affected the, because it's also a marker uh, for those club and goblet cells. But, but you really ought to look at each of these and ask yourself, you know, do you understand why it's abundant? Uh, should you filter it out? Uh, is it a warning sign that something went wrong in your experiment? This is a, an important quality control. Um, we have, you know, these are called violin plots and the code above here um, makes them. Um, these are histograms. They're actually, uh, they're just designed to look sort of nice. Um, but you know, really the way you should look at this, it's kind of like, sorry, let me try to draw a straight line. So, you know, you have the straight line there and then you have the distribution there. Um, you actually, it's kind of nice uh, in Python, you can also in R, you can plot the individual cells. And it's just showing you the distribution of like how many genes you detected per cell. You can see that a lot of cells don't have that many genes detected. Then there's some cells where you saw a lot of genes, the same with the UMI counts. Um, and this is the percent mitochondria per cell. You can see there's a hard threshold here at 30 because we did a filter um, at 30%. So that's why the plot only ends right there. So um, uh, this is all basic you see. And, once you have it in this notebook, you're good to go for your own data because you can just literally rerun the, whole, the, the data set itself. Um, I want to show you this is an important box before we go on. Um, the reads are generally recorded for these droplet assays in CPM units. This stands for counts per million. Let me write this here, counts per million, which just means that one has normalized um, uh, 
uh, one, one has normalized um, the counts in each cell by dividing it by the total number of reads in that cell. Now there's a lot of ongoing research how to do this better. That's not the ideal way to do things, uh, but that's one way to do it. Um, people also afterwards do log 1P it's called, you know, um, that's just log of the CPM number you got plus one, because if you got zero counts, your logarithm of zero is, uh, uh, is, is undefined. So you add one so that if you had zero counts, you get zero. And this is a useful procedure. The logarithm stabilizes the variance. Um, it, it's, it's got a couple of nice properties. It's, uh, that's why people do it. Um, so that's what's going on in these boxes right there. Um, and oh yeah, finally, very important step. Um, the columns of the matrix have been scaled, sorry, I'm not going straight here, have been scaled to uh, zero mean and unit variance. And that's because um, when you do PCA, the underlying statistical model for PCA is assuming that about your data. If you don't do that, the visualization and the clustering is going to be very affected uh, by, by certain genes as opposed to others. So, so that's why you're doing it. Now get to the really fun part um, where we're going to do PCA. This is a dimensionality reduction technique. I'm running already at 2 tenths, uh, you know, a PM, so I'm going to not talk about it too much. Um, I have some text on where you can read about PCA, but this is a method that takes the, the cells. Each of them is now represented by about 20,000 numbers which is the gene expression vector for each cell. And now you want to smash it down and make a two dimensional picture. Now what people do is they tend to do PCA to 50 dimensions or so. And then they use this procedure called TSNE. I'm sure you've all heard about it to make a picture. So let's go and look at some of those. Um, and here's an example. Um, so this is doing PCA on my one sample um, and then smashing it down further to 2D in the TSNE. Um, there's a lot of literature now and opinions about whether you should use UMAP or TSNE. You can do either one with these notebooks. It's not hard to switch to UMAP. Uh, but the idea here is that you can see sort of different group groupings of cells and they hopefully correspond to cell types. We'll talk about that in a minute. We put the colors on here by running a clustering algorithm. And again, there's dozens of choices. We've used one here called Leiden. It's named after a town in the Netherlands. It's modifies a method called, uh, it's, a, it's a sequel to a method called Louvain, also a town in the Netherlands. Um, and these are kind of what you might call a de novo. I mean, these methods don't know anything about the cells. They're just trying to see which cell is similar to which other cell. And they have some parameters you can cluster more or cluster less. Yeah, once you're at this stage of your data, it gets very exciting because now you can really start to do biology and you can ask, what is this little blue cluster here? What is the brown cluster over there? Um, you, know, you know, one question that you might ask is, um, and I think somebody did ask it, is, you know, why not just do TSNE in the original data? Why do PCA at all? I'm going to ask you um, to find out for yourself, okay, and just you can skip the PCA step easily here. Um, you know, you can uh, do like going through the notebook. It's a great exercise. Um, it's over here. Um, exercise. Um, uh, and you'll find out why. Um, it basically, the PCA, it, one of the things it's achieving is it's removing noise from the data. Uh, and, uh, and so that's one really good thing it's doing. So, but, but the best way is to just, uh, uh, to, to just try it yourself. Now, regarding clustering, I, you know, I mentioned that we use this method called Levin. Um, sorry, not Levin, Leiden, uh, apologies. Um, there's a lot I could talk about how you cluster. Um, it's a little bit of an art more than a science. Clustering has always been an art form in, in data science, you know, or statistics. Um, you know, a, you, you know it's, it, no matter how many cells you've put in a cluster, you can always try to cluster it further. Now, there are some people that like the idea of splitting clusters only if 
you can, in the two halves that you just made, find the gene that's a marker, a sole marker for one of them. Now, other people feel that that's a very restrictive definition of when you should stop clustering. Uh, but there's no real good answer. I mean, the way it usually works, like it did in this data set, is that they clustered and then they looked for marker genes, sorry, and they tried to see that they made some biological sense. Um, but, you know, again, we could probably have a whole workshop just on that um, and, and how to play around with that. I want to talk, so since somebody asked about clustering, let me talk about this plot. It's a lot prettier. Um, uh, and, and the reason is that what we've done here is something that's not very standard currently in single cell RNA-seq, but it makes nice pictures, is um, once we did the clustering here, instead of doing PCA, we used a procedure called NCA. And you can read about it. Um, uh, it it's, um, what it's doing is it's taking the data and it's trying to find a projection that um, separates out the cells by the clustering that you did in the, in, you know, uh, in the original space. And so it's trying hard to make sure that what we colored blue ends up blue and what we colored red is red and, that red and that they're separated from each other. But it's still doing a linear map or a projection, kind of like PCA, but it's not trying to maximize something else. PCA is trying to find a projection which maximizes the variability amongst the points. And this one is trying to find a projection that best separates out the clusters. And so, it, you know, uh, we have found this one to be useful and we wanted to show it to you in this notebook. Um, uh, it's just another way uh, to, to do the clustering. Uh, I'll, I'll stop for a second uh, to ask Sean if there are any questions. Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of questions. So um, a good one is, um, you know, why, how do you choose the number of components to PCA down to, um, and yeah, like why 30 versus like 20 versus 50? Uh, I will tell you that there's no knowledge, like there's no careful experimental or theoretical work on this actually. Um, we've played around with this a little bit. Um, it seems that PCA to too low of a dimension throws out real signal in your data. Um, so that's no good. Um, you know, we don't, you know, at some point it seems to not matter too much the dimension of the PCA, whether you're doing 50 or 60. Um, so, but it does seem to help a lot to, to answer the, the previous question where I offered it as an exercise. Uh, you know, not PCing at all is also not good. Um, you know, one of the things people do is they do what's called an elbow plot. We've already talked about the knee. And they look at how much variance is explained with each additional dimension. So, you know, if you look at PCA, you tend to get plots like this, where initially you explain quite a lot of the variance with the first PC, then less with the second, third. As you go on, you explain less and less of the variance. Um, that's by design of PCA. And you can kind of try to find the sweet spot where You've explained a lot of the variance, but the new components don't add very much. Throw those out. Um, in particular, there's something interesting going on in this domain where people are doing PCA followed by TSNE. We don't have time today to talk in detail about TSNE, but whether they do that or UMAP, they're applying a nonlinear procedure to the initial dimensionality reduction. And I don't know of good theoretical work or good understanding of how those two things interact with each other, to be honest. Uh, okay, I think I think that's it on, on, on my end. All right, so let me go on. Um, now we ran some methods to find marker genes. Um, in ScanPy, it's going to be the same as in R. You can use lots of methods. You can use the t-test. And what you're doing now is you're going cluster by cluster. We have 11 clusters. It's zero index. So that's the first, the second, all the way to number 11. And for each of them, we're asking, for each gene, is this gene expressed differently in this cluster than every other cluster? So we're doing one versus the rest, two versus the rest, and so on. And if you zoom in here, you'll see that we have a score. This is really the negative log of the p-value. And you can see that some genes come out um, as, as you know, markers, um, uh, you know, as markers, for example, here in this one, sorry, the last one, you'll see PBPB PB right there seems to be very significant, uh, and we're just showing the top few. 
that's very useful to find markers for your cell types for a lot of reasons. First, it can kind of verify that the clustering you did is biologically meaningful. Oftentimes it's useful because you're going to do some follow-up work where you want a gene marker so that you can, you know, for example, target that, that cell type in an animal. Um, there's lots of applications. So, so this is very important. Um, this method Bonferroni is correcting the p-values for the fact that you're testing lots and lots and lots of genes. You could use other methods as well. Um, so there's, uh, 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 so there's, you know, lots of choices here. Now the t-test, um, you know, this will coxin test. This is a whole, uh, you should really do an introductory statistics class. These different tests make different assumptions about the data. T-test assumes normality of the data. That's not going to be true here, actually. It's kind of true because we did this log logarithm step, but it's not actually going to be true. So you might, your p-values might not be that accurate. Um, on the other hand, the way in which many people use these, or the way you might use these tests, is to not worry about too much about this y-axis, but just to pick off the top things that occur at the top of the list. And we did a couple of tests for you here so that you can see that even with another method, um, like here we did logistic uh, regression, you know, logistic test, um, you'll still see, I think, this gene at the top. You know, here it's number two and previously it was number one, so they switched places. Um, I think this here is the Wilcoxon test. That's a non-parametric test, so that's not assuming that your data is normal or anything else. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a price you pay for giving up on that assumption, but here this gene came out at the top. But if you're just looking at the top five, it's not gonna really matter. Um, on the other hand, if you really care about the p-values, then it does matter. So, um, so that, that's how that works out. And we made a table here, um, and you can look at this table and you know, this is the top rank gene all the way to the bottom, um, and you can look at each cluster. Um, actually, let's look at this one right here. We could do the others if you like, but, but let's go back for a second to the paper. Uh, oh, I keep getting it wrong, sorry. Let's go back to the paper. Let's go to the top figure again. I just want to show you that we're not crazy stuff. Uh, doing, you know, we, we're, we're, we're reproducing the results of this paper. Um, I think it's right there. It's one of the markers they found. It's... Uh, Let's look at these dots right here. They're all empty. There it is. If we now like go this direction, uh, sorry, let me just uh, go in this direction. You'll see that we're looking at megakaryocytes. So this marker is a marker for megakaryocytes and uh, that's a known marker. So everything adds up here. We've reproduced the results even just with one sample. It's actually very nice because if you look at, um, sorry, if you look at our, um, uh, if you look at this, one of our clusters identified this as a marker. So, you know, we don't have 30 cell types here because one of the things is we're looking at just one sample and not all of them. We have less data, but we have found megakaryocytes. Okay. So, um, and then you can look at, you know, here it's looking at the p values for all the clusters. We're looking at a hundred genes at a time. Um, and so you can see here, uh, you know, the, for one of the tests, the very, very significant p-values come out. Um, there's PBPP, it's a 10 to the negative 12, even after correcting for testing. So that's what we did there. And now you can make plots and the code is in here and we're running out of time. So I won't go into this in detail, but you can make these like histograms where you can see how much of PBP, P, PPBP, sorry, it's the tongue twister, is in each of the clusters. You can really verify that it's very abundant in cluster 11 or 10 here, um, and, and it's absent in all the other ones. It's very nice to confirm this kind of thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, the thing is, um, all of this like assignment of the cell types um, to the marker genes is automatic. There's actually, um, well, let me just skip ahead here. Um, you can actually label the picture 
uh, label each of these clusters with its marker, and there's PPDP. Now, there's, um, you can make these beautiful pictures for each one of these markers. Um, it's a very powerful uh, method. And, you know, one of the great things about reanalyzing data is today we're going to look at ACE2. And it's not really a marker, but it's an interesting gene. So st frequently in these papers, people end with this, okay? Um, and they might even make an Excel sheet they share. Uh, but there's a lot of, lots and lots of interesting biology to look at and think about, um, even in this one paper. Uh, so anyway, going back to this, this plot is very useful. We love to do these kind of plots. This is putting a red dot everywhere where we see this gene highly expressed in a cell. This is the cluster you already know um, that corresponds to PPDP. Um, it, you know, we have a couple of outlier dots and that's probably because this projection schema was not perfect. After all, we're looking at 2D, at data that had you know, 20,000 genes. Um, uh, but you know, to first order, uh, almost all of it's there. And, um, and you saw that in this uh, histogram plot. So it's really fun to play with these plots. All the code is here. None of it is complicated. Um, you, you, you don't need to know how to code. I really want to say this because I've tested on this on some of our lab members and others, um, you just, you know, you can look, just reading this, learn, figure it out enough, I think, uh, to play with it, even if you're not an expert um, coder. Uh, by the way, I, um, I, I should say that we've been careful to put X and Y axes on these plots. Um, somebody just asked about that. Here, you're looking at log CPM plus one, and these are the different cluster numbers. When it comes to these maps, um, this is, you know, TSNE coordinate one, TSNE two, and there's no real meaning um, to the two axes that you're looking at. That's not true with PCA. When you do PCA, there's a meaning to the axes, uh, but not when you do uh, these TSNE plots. Okay, so um, I really like this kind of plot. It combines all the plots that we just saw before, where now you have the clusters um, in different colors on the y-axis, the markers on the x-axis, and you can really see what's a marker for what, where, and how. Um, uh, it's, it's really fun to do this kind of thing. You can replace these with different genes. It's, it's not hard to learn this once you look at the code, I think. Um, and I wanted to show you one more thing we did. Um, just because we wanted to tie back to the paper and make sure we're not off the rails. Um, we, if you look back at figure one, um, uh, which is here of their paper, they had very specific gene markers that they settled on for all their cell types. If you look at what we've done, we've taken the same genes here that they had in their figure and you can see that, you know, we have fewer clusters here, so we probably merged some of the true distinct cell types into one because we're only looking at one data set. But you can see that they, they look, everything validates uh, to first order very nicely. This gene that's everywhere, we see that. Um, the PPBP that we just talked about, it's right there. And there, there it is, the megakaryocytes. So everything's validating reasonably well. Okay, I'm gonna pause there uh, to ask if there are questions, but I'd like to wrap up fairly soon the last part. Um, yes, so the first question, um, so this was actually a bit ago. Someone asked why use TSNE versus UMAP versus any other type of visualization technique? Okay, that's a good question. And that's a trap because this is being recorded and whatever I say will be held against me in some future setting, uh, I have no doubt. Um, uh, you know, I think that, um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. This method TSNE, it was developed by uh, Jeff Hinton and his colleagues. These are machine learning people quite a while ago. Um, when they developed it, they didn't actually think about it in conjunction with PCA, first of all. So whenever people say TSNE versus UMAP, we should keep in mind that we're using this in conjunction with another method. Um, it may be a lot more important exactly what that other method is. Um, that's my first comment. Secondly, um, TSNE and UMAP are different. There's some excellent blog posts and 
I'll be happy to tweet out or maybe share on the GitHub later, uh, add maybe to this, uh, to this document uh, some reading if you're interested. Um, people have had some good luck with, the, with UMAP just empirically and anecdotally visualizing cell differentiation. Um, having said that, there's some math theory behind TSNE that, that, that I like. Um, the NCA method that we've introduced recently to this field, we, we used it recently in one of our frequents and here in this notebook today, I think is very powerful. Uh, once you have an existing clustering, maybe your collaborators cluster the data even by hand um, or partly by hand, then it's nice to visualize with respect to that because why just visualize ab initio without using the information you already have? So I don't think there's an easy answer for this that would, I can give in a few minutes. It would require really like thorough discussion and, and a whole lesson or two. Um, so I partially punted. Okay, another question. Um, someone asked about distance metrics and sort of like, you know, if you look at one of these dimensionality reduction pictures like a TSNI, how should one think about distance metrics between the cells in that projection and cells sort of like in their ambient space? Okay, so the PCA is a linear map. Um, so that's one thing. Linear maps are, you know, you can understand them to basically project, rotate, shrink, scale. Um, when you, uh, they're linear maps, so linear maps are linear maps, and that means a certain thing. Um, when you start talking about TSNE or UMAP, they're applying nonlinear transformations to the data, which means that you can't really, you, you cannot really give meaning to the distances that you see in the actual picture. Like if I go back up here, um, you know, uh, you know, this being further away from this, you can't, it doesn't mean necessarily anything at all. Um, so you have to interpret this very carefully. Um, uh, yeah, there is some meaning to the fact that, you know, um, if you see two things close together here, then you can infer something about the fact that they were close together in the original space, but but having things far away here does not mean that they were far away necessarily in the original space. So so maybe that I'll leave it at that for, for, for now. And then so another person had questions about uh, TSNE parameters. Yes. So like what parameters one would set. Um, for preserving the Again, there's, there's an actual article I'll point you to called The Art of TSNE. And I will tell you that I don't think in any of these data sets that there's a one answer. Um, you know, I don't advocate for you playing with the parameters until it looks perfect. On the other hand, I think the picture itself is not really being used quantitatively. You can't, I just said that. And so, as, you know, you're trying to make a nice picture that, that your biologists can look at and see, you know, I think I've thought a lot about why are people making these pictures at all? And I think one reason is, is that you're seeing every dot as one of your cells and you can feel like you're looking at the actual data you made. You paid a lot of money, you spent a lot of time in the lab, you killed a lot of mice. Now you can really see that you did something. Um, I think, you know, sometimes when people are looking at cell differentiation, um, uh, trying to look at trajectories of genes or time, developmental time, Sometimes the picture is kind of nice because you can verify that what you're seeing makes sense. Um, but I don't think they're very quantitative. And so I, I don't think it actually matters from that point of view exactly what parameters you use because you're not really going to interpret anything from them that's really meaningful. So there was another question about um, taking, for example, two different samples and projecting them onto the same space. Maybe you could talk a bit about uh, those different uh, tools such as SCVI. Yeah, that's a great question. We're not going to get into that, unfortunately, in today's workshop, and we had thought to do that in a future workshop. There's a lot of methods to integrate data sets. Um, my own lab, we've written some, a recent paper about a modification to SCVI, so we have opinions about these methods. Um, they're really important in, in, in cases like this specific data set, if you're going to look at young and old mice and that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, yes, I think it's a great question. It's an important thing to do. Um, I like SCVI as a method, uh, but that's not to say I don't think there are other good methods. Um, and uh, one thing I will say is that I think 
there's a lot of recent work where people have shown that there's been some confounding you know, between normalization, dimensionality reduction, and data set integration. And, um, and so I think there will be more work coming out soon about that. Um, but yes, I think that's an excellent topic. And it's also interesting to integrate data set from different modalities. Um, uh, and so I think that would fit better in, in a workshop on that topic, which people have already asked for today. So maybe we'll, we'll table all questions for now. And if you have them, uh, we can return to them during the Q&A session in the interest of time. Okay, great. So let me like get to the armchair virology part. This is where we're going to take uh, a bit of license to speculate um, and just do an exercise to show you that I really feel that any biologist who's home right now um, and even has a mind to think about anything other than the, the, the tragedy that we're living through, if, they, if you want to learn some bioinformatics, I certainly think it's a hard time to do that, but if you wanted to, um, and then I think it's really great that you can extract novel biology out of any one of these data sets. And, um, and for myself, I mean, you know, I don't think I'll be doing a lot of this in the very near future, but after this whole crisis is over, I um, plan to do a lot more of this. And, and so we, we, we pulled up ACE2. Um, there's been a lot of, um, uh, of recent talk about the ACE2 gene because it looks like coronavirus enters the lungs, um, enters cells, uh, by virtue of using this protein. Um, yeah. And I think that it, this data set is, is in mice, but it's quite interesting because um, it, it's in the lungs. So we went to take a look and, and the first thing we did, uh, that's what this code block up here does, um, that I'm showing you there. I mean, the first thing we did is we, we just looked at the picture we had before and we asked like, which cells is ACE2 expressed in? And you know, we have like here, a couple of dots here. Um, we actually found five, so you know, um, and uh, and that's very consistent with existing literature that ACE2 is very rarely expressed in the lung. It is expressed in a couple of cell types in the lung. It's not a lung gene, uh, so to speak, and so it's um, it's it's quite rare. And uh, okay, so we thought that was interesting. You know, we're we're verifying. I mean, it was a good thing we didn't see a ton of it. Um, but now we were actually curious to what extent is it expressed in all the samples and how different it is from young and old mice. Um, I'm going to pause for a second here and uh, ask you to go back, back and look at the, the poll that I did uh, earlier today. Um, I hope you filled out the poll and if you go back on the Twitter, uh, if you have a Twitter account, you don't need to, you, go, you don't need to have an account, you can just look at the tweet. Uh, I'm going to pull up the poll. Uh, let me just see if I can find it here. Um, the final results were that there were 288 votes. 41.3% um, guessed that it's more highly expressed in old lungs and 16% in younger and 42 the same. And, and I'm going to confess now that this was a trick question. So it really matters when you write a poll how the language is parsed and we did this on purpose. So. We're going to see here, if we go down a little bit in the notebook, uh, this is, by the way, a and of all of the cells from both the young and the old all mushed together. It's a very rare gene. You see that here. It's, it shows up now a little bit here and there, but it's not very highly expressed. You can see it's kind of localized down here. Um, uh, but what we did is we then asked, uh, for the difference between young and old. And here's an interesting plot. So if you look at the expression of ACE2 in cells where it's actually expressed, because it's empty in many cells, but where it's actually expressed, it's about the same. Okay, maybe I should be like approximately. So it's correct to answer that poll and say that the gene expression is the same. However, you can ask a different question. How many cells is it appearing at all? And you find a huge excess in young versus old. And so in the, in the spirit of armchair virology, we're not making any claims here, um, it's actually consistent with a paper that has not been cited very much or looked at very much. It's published during the last uh, you know, crisis, which was the SARS crisis in 2006. And in the rat, there's actually evidence that's completely consistent with this, 
um, showing that there's higher expression in young versus old. So I just wanted to show you, I mean, this is just one simple little question. I'm not, I have no idea if there's any significance to it, but you can learn a lot of interesting things um, by just, uh, you know, uh, running literally this notebook. I will say that in order to facilitate this last part, um, we did not actually process all of the data to make this picture right here in this notebook. It was downloaded from the web, from uh, you know the actual just the matrix we needed um, because uh, we just wanted to save time. But it's not hard to run the other um, uh, samples through this notebook, and we will make the exact notebook we used to do the ACE2 part available as well uh, on this GitHub repo. So, um, uh, so that's what I wanted to say. Um, you know, we're at getting near to 2:40, so I don't want to talk the whole afternoon. I want to just end with one or two uh, asks of you. The first is feedback. Um, uh, it would be fantastic to give us feedback. I've never done something like this ever. Um, uh, Sina's not done something like this, but you know, I think that uh, we wanted to just use a little bit of our time to help people in bioinformatics. I got a lot of requests. We're really happy to do it again. I can do the same, uh, or we can do the same notebook again, but we're happy to do other things. If you find errors in this notebook, please let us. If you find new results in this data set, let us know. We'd be happy to work on it with you. Um, we think it's actually a very good, interesting data set. It was well done. Um, I want to note, I'm, I'm going to do something that's very uh, selfish, uh, but here I have still 265 of you on the call, um, and uh, there's currently uh, several postdoc positions open in our lab. Um, it's not why we did this, but, but it's an opportunity to let you know. Um, feel free to contact us. You can find info on our lab website. We have room for experimentalists who want to develop technology. We've been doing multi, you know, developing multiplexing technology, and we have another, uh, several other, uh, I think, very exciting experimental projects in our lab. We're also looking for computational biologists. So um, this is uh, a wonder, would be wonderful if you followed up with us. I really want to thank Lambda, especially. There's a, a student in our lab, uh, Sina, who not only um, you know, here today, but, but built these notebooks. It was a huge amount of work to make uh, something like this work on the Google Cloud. I hope that most of you got this to work today. Um, you know, uh, if you didn't, please let me know or let Sina know in private. If it did work, then please go advertise that on Twitter, um, but not the other way around. Um, uh, hopefully, your notebooks are done by now. This shouldn't have taken this. I, I ran this literally actually this morning one last time. Um, so I, I think this infrastructure is good, but I'm sure there's many, many things that were not good today and that we can improve. Uh, so please give us feedback. And I'll stop there and take more questions uh, via scene if you have any. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. We had a bunch. <laughs> um, so it seems like a lot of people are having. Uh, so it seems like Colab is not processing this. Uh, you know, it keeps on processing. And one thing I will say is that so the way that Colab. Um, distributes compute resources is if there is sort of like a, a peak or a lull in compute resources for Google and is it in its entirety, it will like let the notebooks use some of that. So sometimes it can be slower or faster. And so maybe since all of us at once tried to run this thing, there was sort of like a spike in compute. And so that that's why it took a little, a little longer. But I will say that it, the notebook will run from start to finish in its completion on one of these notebooks. So maybe just try it again in a few hours um, and play around with the parameters and, and, and tell us what you got. We'd love to, we'd love to hear about it. Um, so let me just see, there's a couple questions. Uh, uh, so I don't think there's any way to increase the speed um, that you can run on Colab, but um, you'll just have to let it run. So the way that we created these notebooks is we first generated a Jupyter notebook uh, on our own computer. And we made sure that we installed via pip all of the, the packages that were required. And then we uploaded it to Google Drive, um, which, uh, so then you can start what's called a collab session with that notebook. So it's like a tool that, that Google creates, um, which allows you to, to run uh, the collab notebook. Um, and then we, we linked it with GitHub. So there's some sort of like um, history to the file. Um, 
Let me see, sorry. Um, so this is an interesting question. So how much, how much do we care that sequencing isn't saturated? Um, and so I, maybe I can answer this from Lior. Um, so, so I think this, you know, UMI versus genes detected plot will give you sort of a good first estimate as to the saturation of your library. And so we, we were also interested in this question from the sort of wet lab perspective. So in bus tools, which is one of the utility, like one of the command line utilities that is used to process data, we have this tool called bus tools inspect, which allows you to look at your data and it will tell you if you were to sequence at double the depth, how many new genes would you detect? And I think this is really powerful. Um, you know, if you're just like a wet lab biologist and you wanna say, should I spend this extra money to detect new genes? And it uses this thing, it's called a good Toolman estimator. I'd recommend looking it up. It's a, it's a really cool estimator for determining this. Um, so let me see. Um, um, so someone asked if you can run our markdown files on Collab, the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, and we, I think we'll have at some point a workshop in R using Collab. Yeah, we can run R in Collab and we've done that. If you go to the Coastal Bus Tools website, maybe you can link to that right now, Sina. You yeah. can find examples of R notebooks uh, with other data sets like we've done today. Um, and we can also uh, work on making this one available in R. It's, a, it's wonderful, it works very well actually. So I just sent out a link to the Callisto Bustles website. So if you go to tutorials, there is a list of notebooks um, and we'll add this one to that list of notebooks as well. Um, sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to get through them. Um, so, so, so someone asked if there's a way to retain DNA for single cell multiomic studies. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'd, I'd point you to the literature. Um, So someone asked, what's the best way to save the notebook for future use? They've never used Colab before. Um, great question. So what I would recommend, so there's two ways you can do it. One is you can save a copy of the notebook to your Google Drive. There should be a save copy in the upper left-hand corner. This will allow you to run that notebook again and again, but it won't persist in the sense that once you close it, it will sort of like destroy the fact that you had run it. Um, but what you can do is if you go to file, download the iPod, or Python on your computer, you will be able to run it on your computer, the notebook in its entirety, um, and, and it will persist. Um, so someone's asking- Let me just add one thing that it's really, like Colab allows you to load up data from your Google Drive, and that's another very nice way to like, if you have your own data, you can very rapidly, like it will mount the Google Drive so you can just directly process your own data that way. Yeah, so if you have your fast queues, for example, on like a lab Google Drive, you can actually, in the Colab notebook, connect your Google Drive to this notebook that we, that you have available to you and specify that this is like read one, this is read two, um, and you can just process your data. Um, let's see. So someone asked about a link to a paper. I'm not sure what paper you're referring to. If you could just s s uh, message me the exact paper we're talking about. Um, uh, so all of the collab code is on GitHub, and I'll I'll post a link to it. So so you have all of the code that is used. Um, so all so all the code gener like that generates these figures is is in that notebook. Um, okay, so someone had an issue with uh, collab and connectivity. So yeah, this is we should have mentioned this at the beginning. But if you like navigate away from that window and you're just inactive for some time, the session will sort of close because Google doesn't want you just using it's computer resources and then just not being there for it. Uh, yeah, you're right. We should mention that next time. Um, um, so yeah, someone had a question about, you know, interpreting p-values and log full changes. I, I would point you to the literature on that. I don't, I don't have, I mean, without knowing exactly the context of your question, it's hard to say. Okay, so this is interesting. So someone talked to, someone asked about uh, multi, multimodal analysis. Um, so maybe Leo, do you wanna just give like a, I mean, I could do it as well, but like a brief overview on like how one would process it? Yeah, so there's now a, the possibility um, to 
simultaneously measuring one cell, not just the RNA, but for example, um, salt, at the protein level, salt surface markers. Um, you can also measure uh, ATAC, run single cell ATAC seq. But to measure accessibility, you can measure methylation state. Um, there's, as, there's an assay called patch seq that basically performs patch clamp alongside um, your, your, your RNA measurements. So there's, uh, there's a lot of different modalities, uh, more and more coming on all the time. Um, it is a very, I think, the, it, you know, there's, um, there's very interesting questions about how to look at this kind of data simultaneously. Um, I think the first question though you should have is, why would you want to measure simultaneously one cell different modalities? It may not always be necessary um, to do that. Um, when, it, when, it, when it is informative, you should keep in mind that currently a lot of these technologies are at a trade-off. The more different modalities you're measuring, even if just doing protein, a handful of proteins in RNA, you're sucking up reads from one to the other. So it's not all, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not straightforward to, to understand the results. The data sets are not so great basically right now is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Having said that, there's a lot of interesting computational biology to do. Most of it right now is, I would say, on the research side. We're just trying to figure out what are the right things to do? What are the meaningful things to do? Um, but there are a lot of packages and tools already available. There's a lot of papers on this in the last several months. So be happy to do another workshop on that topic. I think it could be really fun. Um, uh, but you know, we haven't, um, uh, yeah, we, we just decided not to go there today. And I, I should add another one I haven't talked about at all, but it's very interesting and exciting spatial RNA seq, yeah. where in addition to measuring gene expression here, actually measuring where the gene, you know, where the genes are expressed inside cells. So all of this is very interesting, you know, in situ. Um, it's a good question, but it's really a, it's opening up a, a very interesting, but, but large box. Yeah, and I think also, so there's a, there's a question also about, you know, which assays are, are better than others. And I think, you know, there's no, I don't think there's a straightforward answer to this. So um, at least in terms of droplet base, based versus plate based, full length versus spatial. So Leo and I have a, have a, have a recent preprint where, where we, we believe that um, sort of like, if you're looking for rare cell types, a good place to start is to just do 10X on a bunch of cells. Um, and then once you've identified markers for your rare, rare cell type populations, you can go ahead and then uh, fact sort for those cell types and then do SmartSeq, which allows you to get really specific isoform information. So transcript isoform information uh, for those rare cell types. And then you can actually, you know, couple it. Um, you can actually infer spatially where these uh, where these cells are coming from by looking at genes that are expressed, which correspond to the transcript. Um, so that's sort of like a another thing you could do. Um, Leo, there's a there's a bunch more questions. Maybe we'll just try and get through them all. Um, yeah. Let, why don't we do? Let's do three more, and then we'll. we'll okay. So let me just see which ones I think are. Sorry if I don't get to your questions, I apologize. Um, I promise everyone we will do this again. So uh, if you didn't get to your question, we'll do it again. We're, yeah, we're happy to do it. Um, so I guess it's kind of interesting on the armchair virology side point. Uh, someone asked, you know, it's kind of interesting that there are less young people affected by COVID-19, but the expression patterns that we're seeing are, are actually quite, quite different than, than what one would believe. Um, uh, would lead to a higher uh, sort of infection rate in young people. Yes. Uh, would you care to comment on that, Leo? Yeah, so there's some, I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, uh, neither on coronavirus, certainly not even virology, um, and not in the lung. So I'm speaking here as somebody who doesn't really know much, but, um, but just reading the, the general press and looking at, uh, you know, the, the preprint archive over the last month, I think there is some evidence that actually higher levels of ACE2 expression might be protective in the lung. And so there's, uh, there's evidence of that. So it might not be that surprising that children uh, express ACE2 more uh, than adults. Um, I should also say that what, I've just, what we just showed is in mice, uh, it's not in humans. So we shouldn't draw that conclusion either. But I think there is existing literature and uh, evidence that ACE2 might actually be very protective. Um, I do think I will say just from an epidemiological point of view as a citizen, it's bothered me a little bit that there's been some confounding
between prevalence of coronavirus and severity of disease. So there's a lot of talk about how young individuals are not being affected as severely, but I don't think that it's clear by any means, and this I have tried to look for data, I don't think it's clear that children are not getting infected as much. And I'm aware of only one paper, um, I can share it maybe in a minute. There's one paper from China showing uniform prevalence of coronavirus across all age groups, actually. Um, but I, I'm not, but it's a fairly small data set. Um, I, I, so certainly I don't think there's, I don't think there's any evidence that there's less prevalence in children. If not, there might be even more. Uh, but, but, but at the minimum, there's the same. So, um, so it might be that ACE2 is an entry target, but it might also be that it's protective. That wouldn't be that surprising, actually. Uh, okay, this is a good question. So does it make a difference? Is there a difference between Callisto and STAR? Maybe yes. Um, so there is a fundamental difference between Callisto and Eleven and STAR and Cell Ranger. Um, Cell Ranger uses STAR as well. And STAR um, begins the pre-processing by aligning reads to the genome. Um, the Callisto pseudo alignment, and this is also the case with 11, is, is actually based on um, a comparison of the reads to the transcriptome, by which I mean the sequences of transcripts that, that have been annotated inside the genome. So there's a difference there, and there's some debate on which one is better or worse. Um, I'm very happy looking at the transcriptome. Um, we have recent evidence in our group, actually, that you can also de novo assemble the transcriptome and do very well with that. Uh, but there is a fundamental difference there. Um, that's a conceptual difference. There's also like a practical difference. The star aligner um, requires more RAM. Um, and so it's definitely not running on the kind of infrastructure we just talked about today. Uh, but it's a very good tool and Cell Ranger um, as a tool also uh, produces reasonable results. In fact, our pipelines we've recently validated in one of the papers linked to here produces very similar quantifications, um, almost identical actually. Um, it's more a question of resources, um, Cell Ranger especially. Um, STAR has its own workflow now for single cell called STAR Solo, but Cell Ranger uses the STAR aligner and then has its own workflow and it is extremely resource heavy. It requires up to terabytes of storage capacity. It takes to do what we just showed you now in half an hour would, you know, I haven't tested it, but it would take hours. Um, and so it's, I, I think it's very limiting and I really discourage people from using it because I think as biologists, it's very important that you can process your data over and over and over again. You know, maybe with a new mouse annotation as it's updated. Um, maybe include various, new, you know, new genes from other annotations. There's there's new gene annotations that have come out recently. There's one called Chess for results. We're glad, but there are others as well that claim that there are genes that have been missing in current annotations. So for many reasons, you need to have your data in a format, and you, you need to be using tools where you can easily and quickly reprocess your data. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. So there's another good question. Um... So near the beginning of the tutorial, you mentioned the possibility of working on a collaborative preprint publication. Can you discuss how you see this practically working out? I'm an immunologist and have some interest, have some bioinformatics experience, so would be interested in such a project. I'm sure. Okay, so I, um, you know, my motivation for this in the model I'm thinking of is called the Polymath Project. Uh, in mathematics, there's been several collaborative projects um, working uh, online. Um, I haven't exactly um, figured out uh, how to run one of these, but I thought I would pitch it today. Um, if you're interested, please get in touch with me. Uh, the way I'm envisioning it right now is that we work through GitHub. Um, we share a data sets there, results um, in a collaborative format, um, code um, that, you know, um, and then we have a manuscript uh, that's being shared maybe through Google Drive. Um, that we can uh, collaboratively work on at the same time. So they've certainly done that in the math community. Um, those are the two technological aspects I'm thinking of, you know, um, Google, Google Suites and then uh, GitHub. 
Uh, but I don't have details work out and I don't have a specific exact project that I had, was ready to pitch. Uh, but I'm very happy to set something up in the context of coming out of this workshop. I think that would be fantastic. Um, I would, I'll just add as well, I, I previously have used Zoom a lot um, as a PI and on various calls, but it was more as a kind of a format with a few colleagues or a conference call. Uh, I've never tried something like this before, but I've been pretty impressed with Zoom's functionality. And I think we could also use Zoom um, to, to meet regularly in the context of such a collaborative project. It'd be a great idea. Yeah, so maybe we will put more information on the GitHub repo and on Twitter. Yes, but um, feel free to email me or Sina directly as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think those are sort of the big questions. Sorry if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, everyone. Um, there's a lot, um, but for the interest of time, I think we could probably wrap it up there. And I want to thank all of you for attending and participating in this experiment with us. We're going to try to make this recording available on YouTube shortly. Um, I really, really appreciate, appreciate everyone's questions. I want to thank um, uh, the uh, Thais and Schiller groups for making this data and making it available to the community that we were able to rely on that. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, one last time. Thanks again. Hope to see you again soon. Yeah, and if you have any feedback on how we can improve or things that you think would make it better, uh, feel free to reach out to us and, and we'd be happy to take that into consideration for next time. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.